Is there someone in your world, someone in your life, who just gets it? Someone who just knows. Who knows what's going on without having to be told? Who just understands, who, who understands the situation without it having to be explained to him. Someone who picks up on not only how you're feeling, but why you're feeling that way. Someone who is able to perceive both the cause and the effect of the situation you find yourself in. Both the negative cause that brought about the negative effect that you're experiencing, but also a, a positive cause that could potentially bring about a positive effect in your life. Do you have someone in your world, in your life, who just gets it? This person is able to empathize with you because they've been there, they've gone through that, they've experienced the same hurt, the same pain, the same disappointment, the same grief that you have. This person is even able to sympathize with you, even though they've never walked a day in your shoes, even, they, even though they live in a totally different life or world, even though they come from a totally different background or, or upbringing, their heart still goes out to you when they see what you're going through. Do you have a person in your world, in your life, who just gets it? Who, who knows not only what to say, but when to say it? Who also knows what not to say? Who knows when, when not to say anything at all? Is this person someone who doesn't make life all about herself? Person who, who gets it? They take a genuine interest in you. They legitimately want to help you. Someone who, who gets it is, is someone who's going to help you see the big picture when all you can seem to do is look at that tiny little piece of the puzzle. Or just the opposite. That person who gets it is going to understand all those little things in life that, that bother you that so many other people would just miss, be oblivious to. Do you have someone like that? Do you have someone in your world, someone in your life, you're thinking of them now who just gets it? Luke introduces us to a man like that. Luke introduces us to a man who gets it. Because of his position of power and authority, he understood submission and obedience. He had every right to be arrogant and proud and rude and condescending, but he chose to be humble. Now, life wasn't about him. It was about those around him. He was able to look at other people's problems, other people's troubles in this sinful world through the frame of, of a bigger picture. How can God use bad things to accomplish something good. This morning, Luke introduces us to a man who just gets it, a man who understood the power of prayer, but was willing to accept God's answer to those prayers. A man who understood that God could do anything, more than he could ever even ask or imagine, but that God would also strike the proper balance between his might, his power, his almighty power, and, and his infinite wisdom to do just the right thing, to know the when, or the where, or the why, or the what of the best possible solution. This morning, Luke introduces us to a man who just gets it. When there was a need, he responded. When it came to worship, he participated. When it came to prayer, he knew where to turn. When it came to witnessing, he spoke the truth in love. 
when it came to the supporting the work of the church, he, he stepped up. This morning, Luke introduces us to a man who just gets it. That man is the Roman centurion that we heard about just a few moments ago. By God's grace, that Roman centurion had been brought to faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was waiting for the promised Savior to come. And again, by God's grace, he saw Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of that promise. But you see, it's not really the Roman centurion who gets it. No, rather, it's his faith that gets it. Faith gets it. Faith understands. Faith understands our own unworthiness. Faith trusts. Faith trusts the power of a loving God. Faith receives. Faith receives the blessings of a living Savior. That's why this Roman centurion built and paid for a brand new synagogue in that fishing town that trading town of Capernaum. That's why he loved those Jewish citizens who resided there. He had heard about their God and the great thing their God had done for his people in the past, people like Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. And he believed. He believed every word that was read. He believed every word that was read in that synagogue. Faith gets that. Faith trusts the power of the living God. And yet faith also understands. Because contrary to what those fine Jewish men had said about him, as he's waiting for the greater son of David to come to save him from his sins, he understood his own unworthiness. He understood that he didn't deserve anything from God except punishment. He understood that he wasn't worthy of anything except death. And faith gets that. So a man with a faith like that found himself where? In God's house. The synagogue in Capernaum. One particular Saturday, one particular Sabbath, a guest preacher showed up. A friend of some of the locals. A friend of some reputable fishermen. A friend of two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John by name. This friend was Jesus. Well, he'd been there before, in and out of Capernaum, at that synagogue, a guest preacher, a guest teacher. He taught the people the word of God. He preached God's grace, the kingdom of Christ. And the Holy Spirit was at work. This Roman centurion knew who Jesus was. Faith gets that. Jesus, Jesus isn't just a good guy. Not just an eloquent guy, a smart guy, a kind guy, a caring guy. Oh, he heard Jesus speak. He spoke as one who had never spoke before. He spoke as one who had authority. And he did amazing things. Things that only God can do. So faith got it. His faith got it. This, this is the fulfillment. This is the Son, the very Son of God. This is the promised Savior. Jesus Christ, he trusted him, the centurion did. So he knew where to turn in time of need, didn't he? His servant was sick. This troubled him. This made him sad. But faith knows where to turn. Faith gets it. He turned to Jesus in time of trouble. He turned to Jesus in time of sadness. He trusted his Savior's love. He trusted his Savior's power. He trusted his Savior's wisdom. And in true humility, not feeling worthy, not as though he deserved anything from Jesus, he sent a delegation to Jesus to bring his own requests to heal his servant. Later on in the account, he's going to send some of his friends to Jesus to say, don't come under my roof. I don't deserve that. I'm not worthy. But rather just say the word. Say the word and my servant will be healed. You don't have to come under my roof. You don't have to see him. You don't have to touch him. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Faith gets that. Faith trusts the power of a loving God. Faith also receives the blessings of a living Savior. 
the confidence of knowing Jesus has the power to help. The peace of knowing Jesus has the wisdom to do what's right. The comfort of knowing that no matter what happens in this life, eternal life is waiting for those who believe in him. And yes, in this situation, the joy of seeing his servant miraculously healed. Can you imagine the impact that that had on this Roman centurion? Can you imagine the appreciation, the gratitude, the thanksgiving? Because faith gets that too, doesn't it? Faith gets the proper response to the power, the wisdom, the grace, the love, the help of a God who cares. Imagine the impact this had on his everyday life, on his prayer life on his worship life, on his witnessing, on his support of the work of the church. If this man knew where to turn in time of need before this, he certainly knew where to turn in time of need now. And if this man told others about Jesus before this, he was going to tell even more people about Jesus now. And if this man was active in worship before this, he's going to be even more active now. And if this man supported the work of the church before this, he would do so even more generously now. Faith gets it. We live in a sinful world. Bad things happen. Faith gets that too. But that's not God's fault that we live in a sinful world, that bad things happen. Happened. The world God created was perfect. No sin, no sickness, no disease, no hurt, no, no death. Blame the devil for that if you want. Blame Adam for that if you want. Blame Eve for that if you want. But don't blame God. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So here we sit today, thousands of years later. We live in a sinful world and bad things happen. So yeah, we turn on the TV and we hear about four teens driving their car down a highway, veering ever so slightly off the road, the car ending in a fiery crash, claiming the lives of four young people. Bad things happen in a sinful world, like flooding, flooding that destroys people's homes, that displaces families for months, that keeps farmers out of their fields, it drives up the cost of corn. We get that. Faith, get that. Bad things happen in a sinful world. Wars, rumors of wars, Iran in the news again, famines, earthquakes, persecution of Christians, if not physically, then what they believe, and what they profess, and who they are, and what they can do, what they can't do. False teachers out in the world spreading lies, trying to lead people away from Jesus, just like we heard Paul write to the Galatians. Nothing new there, right? People falling away from faith. Bad things happen in a sinful world. Faith gets that. Especially when we look at our own hearts and our own lives. Our own pain when people hurt us. Our own doubts when bad things happen happen, our own frustrations when nothing good happens, our own envy when others are more successful, our own fears when the diagnosis is revealed, our own guilt when we stare at our sin in the mirror. Faith gets that. Faith gets it that we are unworthy. We don't deserve anything from God except punishment. We're unworthy of anything except death. Faith knows where to turn in time of need, in time of guilt, in time of repentance. Faith trusts the power of a loving God. And faith receives the blessings of a living Savior, the peace. The peace of a tiny baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, born to be our Savior. The confidence of a, of a substitute born under law, to take our place under law, to say no to temptation, to refuse to sin, to put the devil in his place as though we had done those things. 
the appreciation of an innocent one who wore our guilt and endured the punishment that we deserved and died a death that made things right with a holy God. The confidence of a living Savior who swallowed death up in victory and promises that because he lives, we also shall live. Yep, faith gets that. Faith understands. Faith understands our own unworthiness. Faith trusts. Faith trusts the power of a li living God. Faith receives the blessings of a loving Savior, the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Faith gets it. Faith is able to see the goodness of God in the midst of all that's bad. Faith is able to shine a light in the darkness. Faith is able to sow love where there is hate. Faith is able to offer healing when there is hurt. Faith is able to offer peace where there is sin. Faith is able to embrace eternal life at the moment of death. Can you imagine the appreciation, the gratitude, the thanksgiving, the impact that this object of our faith can have on our everyday lives, on our prayer lives, on our worship lives, on our witnessing, on our support of the work of the church, if we knew where to turn in time of need before this, we certainly know where to turn now. If we were active in worship before this, we'll be even more active now. If we told others about Jesus before this, we'll tell even more people now. If we supported the work of the church before this, we'll do so even more generously now. Why? Because faith gets it. Our faith gets it. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. At this time we'll bring our offering.